I've learned to not measure success only in the most obvious of ways and kind of realize what success actually really means. Welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast with me, Sam Harris, your host. I invite fascinating humans from all walks of life to share their wisdom and unpack their mindsets and formulas for growth. Hello, hello. Today we have an amazing guest in store. I'm super excited to bring you this episode. We learn some great principles for growth and life in general, and my guest Lorenzo has a fantastic framework for grounding yourself in reality and staying true to yourself whilst also making the most of opportunities as they arise. And he's always chosen to zig when others say zag and ignores the traditional pathway. He has an amazing set of accomplishments, which you will now hear about in the introduction, and it's insane. So uh, listen to the rest of the episode, because this guy is truly brilliant. I'm delighted to have Lorenzo Theone. You're a named inventor on 30 patents, which I am super keen to just have my name on one <laughs> and say that's 30 more than me. Uh, an investor advisor in 80 plus startups, but I think it might be a lot more since you updated your profile. You're the managing director of Gangels, Angel Syndicate, investing in companies with LGBTQ plus founded startups. And you're also the founder of The Social Edge and Start Out, and you ran a Broadway musical for a few years. So you've done lots of cool things and you've got a degree in computer science, I think. So yeah, hello. We really like people that do lots of stuff. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I think a lot of people look at the things I've done and sort of my career or the projects I've gotten involved with and they struggle to see the connections and they're like, this is all over the place. It's always interesting for me because it makes perfect sense. For me, mm. it's always kind of a, there is a through line around a lot of the projects that I've worked on. And you know, ultimately, if I see something that is really interesting and cool and an opportunity to learn and to work with new people, smart people, I always jump in it without sort of being too worried about what is the right course or the right path or whatnot. So happy to talk about any of those or, or just what I've been doing right now. But yeah, thanks for having me. My pleasure. And yeah, that, likewise, I've done quite a few sort of things that maybe don't seem connected and maybe like you can sort of join some of the dots in hindsight, but it's generally always been something that just seems super fascinating and a big opportunity to learn. And one of my first guests was the inventor of Siri, who sold it to Apple. As you I know Adam know. well. Yeah, uh, diff different one, Antoine Blondeau. Oh, the other one. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but he, he said um, in his career, he never did anything for like a pay rise and was always just like trying to learn as much as possible and generally just swapping fields as much as he could just learn. And so I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll follow his advice. He seems like he knows what he's doing. And um, it's going all right for me so far. Cool. So in terms of background before like your professional career was there anything that you learned from an early age that kind of pushed you to try lots of different things that you think sort of made you who you are I mean I think that there's definitely things that I've studied or that I worked on early in my kind of student life that settled or set in some passions and some curiosities that led to very specific projects or very specific areas of investigation for me. And one of them, there was this dual kind of a track between computers, which, you know, sort of computer science, I picked up programming and basic when I was like a little kid and then started playing around with my mom's computer. And that led to as many of us kind of to a career in computer science. But I also really loved languages. I grew up in Italy. So Italian is my first language. I never really grew up speaking or studying English other than in school, starting in primary school, or I think middle school. But even growing up in Italy, just in the regular course of study, you do a lot of language analysis of Italian and even Latin. You know, in high school, I, you know, I studied Latin and that's always been something that I really dug. And that certainly led to kind of the setup for the early stage of my career where I studied computational linguistics, natural language, and led to the founding, first working as a scientist at Xerox Park, which kind of led to a lot of those patents you were mentioning before. And then the founding of my first company, PowerSet, which was one of the earliest attempt at using sort of uh, real semantic natural language understanding technology 
in a scalable way to the problem of web search. And, you know, it became later on some of the early foundational technology folded into the launch of Bing.com. We sold the company to Microsoft in 2008, and I was there for a couple of years uh, before leaving and doing other things. Cool. Wow. Nice. Would you describe yourself as a multi-potentialite then, as in someone that's just fascinated by lots of different things? As in someone that sort of feels like... The first time I hear the words, so probably wouldn't exactly use that word (laughs) to describe myself. Um, I don't know. I think that what's always been true is whenever I kind of like I look at an opportunity and there is something in front of me, the potential, the upside of it is always far, far more interesting. And it's not just financial upside. Is It could be learning upside. It could be getting to work with new people, interesting people, smart people. It always, always, always seems to kind of outweigh the downside or the risks or the things that people around me kind of often say is like, why would you do that? It seems like so crazy and risky. And that's mm. just always been my proclivity. And sort of also recognizing when something that seems so random uh, that happens actually opens up an opportunity to work on something new. And that's always been the case. I mean, it's been the case with Power Set, Start Out, and with Allegiance, the musical I, I worked on for a number of years, which led to you know, the social edge was connected to it. I mean, everything kind of was a chain of things that seemed to happen kind of serendipitously out of the idea of like, wow, this looks interesting. Let's see where this might go as opposed to like, oh, this is just not what I was planning to do, or it's not germane to what I'm working on, or, you know, I'm not supposed to kind of be distracted. That's just, maybe I'm a little ADD. (laughs) Yeah. Turns out I am, Uh, (laughs) which in hindsight was not at all surprising. But yeah, I'm certainly, sounds like maybe you are a bit, (laughs) perhaps, but which is fine when I think it does just sort of bring out the curious side in you and make sure you're kind of working on things that you feel that you're going to put the most energy into and you get like the hyper focus from it. And for sure, it's like a real strength when you use it correctly. So only a good thing as long as you do do stuff. Um, if, if you just constantly drop everything instantly, it's, it's not so useful. So I'm still kind of interested in how you then, yeah, ended up at Gangels then as the MD. Was it just because of your experience and other things that they decided to appoint you or were you part of the founders? Yeah, no, it's actually a pretty kind of a sort of connected path. Uh, so I've mentioned about the acquisition of PowerSet and I was at Microsoft for a couple of years. And one thing that if I go back and look a little bit about about my life that has impacted a lot of the ways that I made the decisions I made is when I moved to the US, just right in the middle of college, right before doing graduate school. And I arrived in Austin, Texas, a handful of months before September 11 happened, which I mentioned because it had actually a big impact. I wouldn't realize immediately, but uh, in retrospect is kind of one of those moments where things kind of take a turn. And in one way, it just led me to come out. Uh, You know, it's kind of like one of those things where you're like, oh, life is too short. Uh, You could die tomorrow in a car accident or an airplane attack or anything like that. And it's just not worth kind of carrying the weight of what other people may say or think and just live your life more authentically. And this was certainly not the 70s, but it also is 20 years ago. So it was a different time, certainly less accepting in certain ways and, you know, with more obstacles in a number of other ways. But that time didn't quite matter as much as sort of it forced me in taking that step. And that would come back into play after the acquisition, when I was talking to several other entrepreneurs who instead had been keeping their own personal life or their spouses and partners away from their boards, their investors, their companies. And it always felt like it created this extra layer of things that they had to constantly be worrying about. Mm. And I remember having these conversations with them and asking why that was. And the answer was always sort of the same, which kind of was, I know what I have to lose, but I don't understand what I have to gain. It's not something I want to, I want to take on. And it felt like in order for them to be able to free themselves of that way, but also for others to feel like that there was a path to say, be building companies and starting companies and not 
constantly be worried about what other people may think or what, you know, whether or not they would do business with you or all of these layers that there would have needed to be that something to gain. And that was actually the reason for founding Startout. Back in 2008, we created Startout as a network modeled on the same model as like women entrepreneurship organization or other ethnic affinity group and as a network of LGBTQ entrepreneurs to help them start and grow businesses while being authentically and visibly part of the LGBTQ community through networking, education, mentorship, connection to funding and business opportunities. And it's really amazing to see that in 12, 13 years that have gone by, the organization is vibrant, has now 35,000 members around the country. It is single-handedly dedicated to increasing the number and the diversity of LGBTQ entrepreneurs in venture, in the venture space, has even minted its first unicorn company out of the Growth Lab Accelerator that it has. But through that network, that's when I met David and Paul, who in 2013 actually founded Gangels as kind of the piece that was missing out of the startup equation, which was to generate directly a, a channel for LGBT investors to invest in their own community and in LGBT founders and in company founded by LGBT entrepreneurs. And, you know, because of my interest, my sort of background history, the fact that I had started start out, I obviously was very interested in what they were doing. I often joke that I did not found Gangels, but that I would, I'm responsible for the Petri dish that uh, it was incubated in. But I was one of their first, if not the first, one of their first investors. And I invested in a number of companies and deals. And the reason why I didn't join them operationally back then was primarily because I had gotten myself into another project that I felt incredibly connected to and really excited about. And so I was like, I can't do that and do something else at the same time. I was trying to figure it all out. So I just kind of took a more passive role in Gangels, mm. investing in a number of deals until 2018, when a lot of my other projects, the Social Edge and Allegiance had sort of stabilized and kind of had a team in place to take care of most of the day-to-day. -day. And David and Paul and I kind of started talking about what the mission um, that Gangels had at the core, you know, it had started as a way for LGBT investors to invest in other LGBT founders, but at the core, the reason for it was to try to make venture as a space and as an ecosystem, one that was better, that was more diverse and inclusive, because it felt like there was this angle, this, this slice of the diversity pie, so to speak, that was not being paid attention to. There were other investors and venture groups that were focused on women or on people of color or various subgroups within it, but there was no one that was focused on the LGBTQ community. But at the same time, we also realized that it was actually not as helpful to only focus on one aspect because whenever there is or there isn't sort of diversity shortcomings within the leadership structure of a company, board or C-suite, or even within the cap table, it is often true that there may be some diversity, but not a full kind of 360 degrees look about how to be truly inclusive. And so we also decided that it was more useful to not constantly be, quote unquote, preaching to the choir or being into our own echo chamber and rather be talking to companies that maybe were significantly behind the ball when it comes to building inclusive organizations and being truly helpful players within the ecosystem would actually move the ball or move the needle forward in a more meaningful way. And so that's when actually... I joined them as uh, a partner in the group, and we broadened the scope of what Gangels was, while at the core maintaining the mission of creating a more diverse and equitable and sort of a more accessible venture ecosystem at all levels of leadership, which means investing in diverse teams that may be women or people of color or LGBTQ founders, but helping those teams round out that diversity, bringing more leaders 
that are from underrepresented backgrounds, both on their C-suite and team, but also on their board of directors, which is a big thing that Gangels does very actively. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing very successfully too, as well as representing true diversity in the cap table of those companies. And this is something that has been getting more attention, but in the past was never really been looked at, which is you can have diversity of perspectives and opinions and representation in a company, but if the value that that company is creating ultimately flows to always the same communities in the same group, you lose the opportunity to create generational wealth and more education mm-hmm. and more advancements for larger broad swaths of the population and other communities. And sort of bringing one of the biggest missing pieces there is access. Folks may have the financial resources to invest, but they might not have the networks. They might not have the sort of negotiating heft or the clout to get into the opportunities that ultimately are somewhat de-risked or less risky and often the ones that uh, are going to generate an outsized amount of the returns. And so that's really where it started to change. And Gangels has now grown into a broad sort of venture syndicate that invests in diverse teams and helps bring more diversity on the cap table and leadership structure of all of our portfolio companies, investing across sectors and across stages, and providing that opportunity to a large, diversified group of investors that both uh, resonate with our mission, as well as obviously look for great opportunities to realize profitable investment returns. Nice. That's amazing. I always think that there's, um, you can do social enterprise, but still be enterprising and make money and, and improve the world at the same time. So uh, that's a great example of being able to invest in profitable things, but actually make them better companies. Because the more diversity you have in a company, the more resilient and more likely it is to succeed. Correct. So, great job. Um, <laughs> nice. And yeah, so one thing I guess I sort of want to ask, but to then then carry back on the conversation around Gangels, was is in you've, you seem to have done a great job of making the most of opportunities and sort of you start speaking about like serendipity and following your interests. So assuming that you have a great mindset for seeing and seizing opportunities, have there been any opportunities that you'd say you've missed and you're like in hindsight, shit, or on the flip side, have there been ones that you did take and you're like, actually, I made a sacrifice doing this and I kind of took the wrong opportunity. And have you built a framework to help you learn from and evaluate opportunities? So yes to all of us, because I think that it's an intrinsic part of growing and learning is both missing opportunities that would have been great and realizing what was the reason why you didn't take those opportunities. And that doesn't actually mean that if you had realized that you would have taken it, but understanding what were the reasons is actually really important to create a mental model of what to do next. And also things that I've done that didn't go the way that I expected or hoped. But I've now, you know, with a little bit more maturity and gray hair, you kind of can see the lessons, the wins, the learnings, even in the outcomes that were not the ones you hoped. And it took me a while to basically understand how valuable and how proud you can be of your failures when you are taking the right things out of it so that you can apply them going forward. And, you know, it just jokingly, one of my biggest ever misses will actually always be my favorite party story or dinner party story, which is right out of the, of the acquisition of Microsoft, I uh, invested in a company that was being started by one of my former employees, which by the way, has been by far my best investing strategy ever has been to invest in all of the companies that all the folks that worked for me went on to start because first of all, we built a great team, but also you really know those people and understand their mindset as well as your own. But I was on the board of that company and I met one of my fellow board members who I didn't really know but it seems like he had been a multiple time founder, uh, was starting a new company. Interestingly enough, this company that he was starting, he was not running, he had someone else run, which kind of was a little bit of a flag for me Mm. and was raising money. And I met with the person that actually was running the company and I decided to say no to that because the app at the time didn't quite work. This black car that was supposed to come pick me up was not coming to pick me up. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow, that's unfortunate. Um, it, it, it is. And at the same time, there have been many other, it, it still makes for a good story and many mm. other investment opportunities that I took that went right. In terms of the failures and things that didn't go the way that I expected, I think the most interesting one is really the show Allegiance, which I really thought would resonate with commercially in a way that would be successful from what I expected it to be, the only way it made sense to measure the success, which is box office, length of run, financial return for investors, and, and so on and so forth. And for a number of different reasons, I mean, we opened the show in San Diego. It became the most successful show at the box office the Old Globe had ever produced in its entire history and ran for longer and had beat a record of audience attendance and all of those things. So we were pretty galvanized coming into Broadway. And for a number of different reasons, it either didn't resonate with the press. It also opened a couple of months after Hamilton did on Broadway, which was a very difficult, challenging moment for any show to gather kind of press attention. And we only ran for six months. And because of the incredibly tough economics of commercial theater on Broadway, a run that is six months for a musical, it's effectively a total loss of capital. And it, it was really challenging to kind of uh, come to term with that and realize, wow, you know, I spent all this time and resources and money and investments and I thought uh, at the time have nothing to show for it. And the reality is that there was enormous uh, amounts to show for it that led to a life for the show to people, the impact on individual audience members and people that still to this day is remarkable. A film that went all over the world, multiple productions now, and even the opportunity to potentially do it next year in London. And so all of that kind of has to be reconciled with the fact that things didn't go the way you expected. And you kind of pick it up and learn and realize that you are incredibly proud for having created something that has this lasting impact on a part of the landscape, cultural and otherwise, and that you know you moved this massive boulder up the hill in order to make that happen. And yes, it would have been better if things had gone in a different way, but you know I've learned to not measure success only in the most obvious of ways yeah. and kind of realize what success actually really means. Mm. One of my favorite topics certainly is success is definitely not linearly related to just money. And when you have the right mindset, you can certainly see how much more of a useful human you've become from anything you really do. If you have the right mindsets towards just learning from it and putting it forwards and still showing up positively to everyone that like invested and helped you along the way. And, and you never know like, who you might meet during the process that then like catapults you into the next thing. It's as in what you think is where you're heading is often not at all where you're heading, but like you end up going somewhere even better, so. Which is the reason why I think it's pointless to try and sort of, and expect that everything goes into one linear way. Mm. And instead it's just like, you have a general direction that you're set on, but then you are maximizing the opportunities to learn from your environment at each point and see where the opportunities lie and build on the goodwill and the sort of information that will allow you to make use of what happens along the way later on. And so absolutely the kind of, relationships I've built, the kind of lessons I've learned, the people I've met that have then been sort of key to other businesses, other projects, and the ones that will still yet to happen is absolutely a huge win from anything I've ever done. Whether or not the linear outcome that I was seeking to obtain was the one that ultimately materialized or not. Back to the topic of Gangels, you mentioned that you sort of broadened the mission to sort of just help companies become more diverse. And what kind of mindset shifts do you think take place when you do help a company achieve that? And also, how do you specifically do that? Do you actually have people ready to go onto boards? And do yeah. you have like, like help with hiring or what? I'd like to understand the specifics a bit more. So the way that we describe and we talk about this is through basically four different pillars of how we work with and represent and help with companies, sort of the diversity element and, you know, bringing them to become more inclusive. One is the most obvious is talent, right? And we've been building over the course of years, a very large sub community of folks, not just investors, but we are big on building communities for all the people that we connect with, be it growing into investors, our investing members, companies, 
everyone. And so, for example, do a, t- a number of events um, across the world, actually in person. Then during the pandemic shifted, everything being remote. And now we're enjoying going back to seeing people in person like we did in London last week. And because we built this community, we have now a broad group and diverse pool of potential talent for our portfolio companies. And so the more straightforward way in which we help them reach more diverse talent is by providing access to the jobs and positions that are open at every single one of our portfolio companies and make those available to our broader community. That paired with when we invest in a company, we ask all of our portfolio companies to sign and acknowledge our Angels pledge or letter, which is available on our website. And one of them is effectively talking talking about kind of the Rooney rule for hiring both across gender, sexuality, and ethnicity, and kind of looking at making sure that for every position they are hiring, that they look at really diversifying the pipeline. And so one way is the way that we help them directly with our portal. We also work with a number of our own portfolio companies whose very business is to help companies diversify their recruitment pipeline, companies like Matheson and Halo and Valence and Canvas, who make their services available to the rest of our portfolio companies to help them recruit at, from a more diverse and inclusive pool of talent. The second one with boards, you were mentioning, do you have people ready to go serve on boards? Effectively, the answer is yes. What we do is we have an in-house board recruitment practice where we work directly with each one of our portfolio company that seeks to add independent board members and would like to make sure that they're also seeing, interviewing, and talking to a broad group of candidates, including people from underrepresented backgrounds. And we work with a number of organizations outside of Gangels that have databases and lists of potential board members who are qualified to serve on public boards, but want to help bring more diversity and representation within the private sector and help those companies identify, vet, interview, talk, and ultimately, when we're successful, even recruit as board members, folks from underrepresented background, women, people of color, LGBTQ. We've helped over 360 candidates be actually seen, viewed, interviewed for these positions, which already by itself, it's a huge KPI because you're basically bringing more more opportunities for candidates to be seen and those perspectives to be weighed against each other. And we've actually helped place the winning candidate in nine independent board searches, which is also a really remarkable sort of number, just knowing how rare it is in the life cycle of a company to even add a board member and how many competing interests there are to actually bring potential candidates to bear in those searches. And so we are super hyper-focused on helping our portfolio companies make sure that they are also with the composition of their board, looking outside of their network and of their immediate vicinity and make sure that they cast a wide net and look at a broad and diverse group of candidates. The third kind of pillar is just brought under the umbrella of DEI initiatives. Each company will have to figure out what that means for them, both in the context of inward, inside, sort of looking at HR, talent, culture, inclusivity, the way that they run their internal processes, but also outside. What does that mean in terms of communication, relating to their audience, who their audiences are? Are they providing, say, anything like inclusive advertising to communication, to the way that they're writing job descriptions and so on? And what we do there is a combination of working directly with our portfolio companies, as well as connecting them to experts and consultants and folks in our network who are experts at helping companies formulate, measure, and implement their DEI strategy, again, both inward and and outward facing. And then the last one is one of the most interesting. I mentioned it earlier, but it certainly has been completely ignored, but it has a huge direct and indirect impact, which is the diversity that happens on the cap stack. And sort of helping bring this representation in the financial stakeholders of the success of a company obviously has a direct impact on bringing that wealth and success in a broader set of communities and not just the usual sort of institutional, educational, socioeconomic circles, but also an indirect one. And uh, there's an interesting story I like to tell of a company we had invested and that shortly after we invested, not even... We had just wired. I got a chance to talk to the CEO again and 
they were thanking us for how much help we had given them by investing. And I'm looking at, at him just a little puzzled because we haven't done anything at that point besides wiring money. And he said, no, I went back to the team and I announced the funding to everybody. And I talked about each one of our investors and nobody cared about the VC that led the round or the big funds that were participating. But when I talked about Gangels and what you guys were doing and who you were and what you stood for, I literally had 10 people, he said, come back to me and thanking me for including you because they saw themselves or their family or their friends or their values reflected in at least one way, the financial outcome of their work. And it's basically to say, if I I do well, my company does well, you know, again, I am motivated by the fact that there is a more diverse, inclusive group of investors on the cap table. And that's, again, a really valuable thing from a culture building and from a retention and an employee attracted attractiveness point of view. And it's certainly something that we are focused on maintaining a really great balance to. So we look for adding investors that are active from underrepresented background. We ask each one of our investors who does join to basically actively mentor and bring on other investors from underrepresented backgrounds so that we can broaden that diversity. And we are very excited to, to even have recently measured that a preponderance, more than 55% of the investments, both in terms of dollars and checks, have come from diverse investors into our portfolio. That's really cool. Great set of a uh, framework that I asked. And yeah, the last one around just making sure that there's more diversity in the people actually getting from things because it's so much in like family offices and people just sort of already wealthy and, and stuff. It's um, not helping with the current situations of diversity and stuff. So yeah, cool. And then how do you gauge companies exactly is in it is it just sort of like like any other investing proposition otherwise besides things because you say you follow all um yeah we are strictly follow on investors we never lead and so we primarily are sort of creating access to our group of investors to some of the best venture led opportunities in the market invest individual investors because we're a syndicate make their own investment decisions as to whether or not they like a deal and they want to invest and you know it's much more about providing that information and that access than anything else but we are looking for opportunities with great teams really large market size traction and a fantastic set of co-investors and this is just venture opportunity so we are strictly venture investors uh, we're not looking at other asset classes at this point and so that's primarily the landscape because of that we can be very nimble and sort of be very active and do quite a significant amount of deals mm. because it's ultimately kind of using and leveraging the social proof that comes from other investors in terms of uh, how to decide which deals are valuable for our um, overall membership or not cool so basically a company that's getting investment from other places can then sort of get investment from you if they've got some good investors mm -hmm. cool that's right but otherwise <laughs> no specific like verticals and stuff yeah no we are because it's such a diverse group of investors mm. also their they interests are in, yeah they're yeah. broad yeah uh, but so most of my direct angel investments seem to all be deep tech by accident. But generally when I'm investing on like CrowdQ or something, it's been like a lot of sort of environment and green things, plant-based stuff and consumery things. But yeah. So I have a few final questions. Yeah. Uh, one, what is one of the kindest things that someone has ever done for you? One of the kindest things. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I would want to say one of the things that I felt there was so little for that person to decide on. And they took, you know, a leap of faith, I think, with uh, working with me. And I am forever grateful and thankful for that because it had such a transformative kind of effect on my career was when I first came to the States and I was an exchange student at the University of Texas. I got a chance to briefly chat with a professor in uh, computer science who ultimately became my sponsor and uh, advisor to stay for graduate school, which of course opened up a huge set of opportunities for me. And I still to this day am not only very thankful, but kind of don't quite know how much information they were able to have or use in order to make this decision. So something, something particularly again, maybe serendipitous or just a good luck and, and fortunate cir of circumstance um, allowed them to take a bet and say yes to this 
exchange student from Italy that came and that hugely, I mean, that could have completely radically changed the, the course of my life. So mm. I don't know that it was out of kindness, but I certainly feel like I am blessed for that particular decision. It's nice. Cool. Thank you. I'm a big fan of kindness. I also wonder, how do you manage your schedule and energy and sort of just the motivation when you're going through like really difficult things? Because um, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I saw myself and was like, holy shit, I look so tired. And um, I have been running a startup for quite a long time. And um, I swear, like the last three months, I kind of keep on surprising myself that I'm still going. I'm like, wow, I, I thought I was really burnt out yesterday, but I, I've got up again today and I'm still going. Do you have any tips for that? It definitely goes in waves. And there are moments when I feel really tired and there are moments that I feel like hyper energetic. I think that to me, the things that make a huge psychological difference are these pieces of my life that I are, that are non-tradable and sometimes like schedule and travel and all these things get in the way of what I would otherwise want to do for nutrition and exercise and sleep. And those really kind of get me down. Like when things get in the way of how much I feel like I need to sleep or how much I need to exercise or, or so on, that really has a huge psychological impact on me. But, you know, I think that it's the two-sided answer of that is I try to keep as much of a routine around the things that I really care about. And also I think that focusing on food, sleep and exercise makes up for the kind of energy that I need in order to do everything else. But mm. sometimes schedule can be grueling. And the other thing that kind of drives me absolutely nuts is if I'm unable to stay on top of my email and it oh, just mate. like, <laughs> yeah, that, that just gives me like yeah, anxiety. anxiety. Which um, as, as something that's, whenever I start a new project, I'm like, I'm so excited that I have to create a new email. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to like this. And um, I just wonder, maybe with running angels, you must have to talk to so many entrepreneurs and, and like investors constantly being like, oh, I just want some more information than this and stuff. And it gives me kind of mild chills of like, oh, I don't think <laughs> this is good. Like, how do you keep on top of all that email? Or is it not so bad? I mean, it is really bad. And right now I feel like I would love to, you know, have external help, but I don't. I'm actually kind of juggling it all. Uh, I think technology really helps. You know, I'm a big fan of trying for zero inbox, uh, mm. although I'm not sort of always successful with that. I do manage my own schedule, have been a big fan of things like Calendly, a Vim call. Those really help a lot. But yeah, it can get pretty mm. grueling. Do you use Superhuman then for your email? Or... I do not. And, you know, I've tried several times mm. um, and I use something, another uh, software that does pretty much the same things, but I feel like it does them better oh, cool. in a lot of ways. Polymail. Uh, yeah, I've heard good things about Polymail. Yeah. Maybe I swap. <laughs> I'm not using Superhuman. I used it for a bit and I was like, it hasn't really changed my life. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. The way just uh, things are visualized does not jive with mine. Mind. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Cool. Well... This has been super fascinating. Oh, yeah. and fi final question. What advice would you give to someone starting out in their career or if you were to meet yourself? No, like I feel like I'm repeating myself, but it's just basically do not try to build this rigid path of what is going to happen this year, next year, and the year after and the year after because the amount in which paying it forward and investing in your relationships and in, in sort of things that don't seem to have a direct connection to what you're doing is the way to build that optionality and that sort of exponential growth later on. I mean, I still get really tired by it, but I try to go to events and meet people and learn about what they're doing and try to be in the places where people are talking about new things, mm -hmm. because that's one of the things that has made the biggest impact for me in the past is like meet people and be open to learning about what they're doing and helping them because they might be able to help you in return in the future pay it mm. forward be super open to opportunities when they happen yeah, I think that's a really nice way to summarize our lessons so thank you so much for um, repeating yourself <laughs> and, and great uh, thanks for coming and um, have a great rest of your Sunday yeah thank you Sam thanks everybody thank you for having me Thank you for joining us this week on the Growth Mindset Podcast. Before you head on to another episode, what's your biggest aha moment from today's discussion? You can share with us your insights and join us on Reason FM. 
Reason FM is a social podcasting app and the best way to discover new podcasts, connect with hosts and other listeners. Also, don't forget to tune into the Wiser Than Yesterday podcast with me and my co-host Nico, and we expose you to a different perspective and dive into the world's most thought-provoking and inspiring books. That's all for this episode, and with that, keep learning and keep growing.